Hello and thank you very much for tuning in to the podcast series by the New Silk Road Project. I am your host today, Charles Stevens, the founder of the New Silk Road Project. This series is dedicated to understanding and raising awareness of one of the most important development strategies of the 21st century, China's Belt and Road Initiative. The centerpiece of the New Silk Road Project, an initiative supported by Jeep, CSIS, Magellan Capital, the University of St. Andrews and Dennis Shirah, was to travel the course of the Silk Road economic belt from London to Yiwu in eastern China, interviewing the key actors and academics along its course. We will have to apologise in advance for some of the tangential moments in this podcast series and also the variable quality of audio footage. We do hope this series sheds important light into China's growing global presence and the significant changes taking place across Eurasia. After a long journey crossing the Caspian Sea and an even longer journey driving across the steppe of Kazakhstan, we arrived in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan, where we visited the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development and spoke to its director for Central Asia, Neil McCain. Indeed, this multilateral development bank sits parallel to AIIB, and in fact, they work together to finance AIIB's very first project, a road investment in Tajikistan. EBRD is not concerned by some of the geopolitical allegations attached to BRI, and in fact, is very keen to develop a relationship and partnership with them in the future. My name is Neil McCain. I'm the director for Central Asia for the EBRD. Um, we've been here for about 25 years in the Kyrgyz Republic, uh, and this is one of our original countries of operations. As you know, the bank was established when the Soviet Union was collapsing, and in the last 25 years we've invested about 650 million euros in the economy of Kyrgyzstan, which is relatively small. Um, I came here from Baku, where I was posted previously, and I now take care of three countries in Central Asia, the three small ones, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan and Kyrgyz Republic. And focusing on Kyrgyzstan, what would you say are the top development priorities of this country and how is EBRD helping to achieve them? Well, we focus, as we do in all of our countries, on the development of the private sector, which is absolutely crucial. Here there's a very uh, vibrant private sector, but the economy as a whole is very small. So it's characterized by a lot of small, medium and micro enterprises that we help to support. But without the infrastructure that they require in order to, to grow and develop without decent electricity and electricity supply, water, roads, transportation links, logistics and so on, it's very difficult to grow your private sector. So we also invest in that. And we also help the government as well with various policy reforms, development of agencies and capacities within the government to help, um, to help the formation and the development of the private sector. So one example is we've helped recently with electronic licensing for businesses here. We've just completed a project in that. And although it's not necessarily relevant to, to Kyrgyzstan, to the region as a whole, oil and gas has been historically very important for its development. With the collapse of oil and gas revenues in 2015, mm -hmm. how does it affect these priorities? Well, you would think at first sight that the drop in the oil price for a, um, uh, for a country which is a price taker uh, and, a, and a huge net importer of natural resources, um, you would think that that would benefit their economy. Uh, but unfortunately, there was a, a devaluation here, which was greater than the devaluation in their two largest export markets, which are Russia and Kazakhstan. So the currency here, the SOM devalued more than in Kazakhstan and in Russia, and it meant that they lost a lot of their export markets as well. There was a, um, a minor crisis in the banking sector when non-performing loans increased significantly. Um, high degrees of unemployment, also very importantly, many of the, um, the construction and infrastructure projects that Kyrgyz um, uh, builders and craftsmen are working on in Russia and Kazakhstan came to an end. So the remittances that the economy relies on a huge amount uh, they didn't stop, but there was certainly a significant um, reduction in the amount of money that those guest workers were sending back to their families here in Kyrgyzstan. And that had a big impact on, on the economy here. 
it was a double whammy for them, unfortunately. I think the recovery from that has been very good. I think the, the regulation in the banking sector has proved to be quite robust. And I think we now have solid levels of liquidity within the, bank, within the banking sector and a fairly stable um, outlook for the economy and for the, um, uh, for, for the government finances. The one thing that worries us a little bit is the extent of the sovereign debt that the government has taken on. But we're, we're trying to help them to manage them, that with the other international financial institutions, including the IMF and, and ADB and so on, to make sure that that's kept, kept at manageable levels. And something that the government has stressed is the focus on digital initiatives and something that's very important to you, along with other things, mm -hmm. is your focus on hard infrastructure. How can digital initiatives and hard infrastructure coexist? What is the relationship between them? Okay, well, I think they push from two opposite sides of the, or two, two opposite ends of the economy. On digital, um, uh, the digitization of the economy here, it's very important to uh, create a better business environment, an easier business environment um, for small and medium sized enterprises. But also, it's important for the government to increase its tax base. The easier you make it for people to to register their business, to come into the light, to open a bank account, uh, to get the licenses that they need to, to open their shop or to sell uh, or to sell um, foodstuffs and so on, um, the easier it is for the government to tax those revenues. The more of the, those revenues that come into the light, the broader the tax base is. The more money that the government has to spend on things like infrastructure development, the more solvent the government is and the more credit worthy it becomes. So they're, they're pushing from, from either side. When it comes to infrastructure development, um, I've already mentioned the, uh, the concerns that we have over uh, the indebtedness of the government, which is at a, um, uh, a level that we're concerned about at the moment. But we're doing all we can to help the government in uh, maintaining that affordability by providing large amounts of grants without infrastructure. So we at DBRD, we focus on a few um, sectors within infrastructure, in particular in the water sector, where in more than 20 cities we've, um, we've provided loans to uh, municipal water companies and wastewater companies for um, redevelopment. Um, sometimes we've provided uh, uh, investment for new water supply, and that means households that didn't previously have water in their homes getting water in their homes. And those can be obviously quite catalytic for those communities. It really changes people's lives. Um, uh, other areas where we're, um, uh, where we're uh, a significant investor is in the energy sector, where we've um, invested in distribution companies in Osh Electro and in Vostok Electro in improving their distribution and reducing losses and improving metering as well. But there the government faces a, a, um, a reform challenge in that they need to increase tariffs over time and that's a difficult thing to do in such a poor country where people can't necessarily afford those tariff increases and historically they've grown used to very, very cheap electricity. In order for that sector to become more investable for international financial institutions and for the private sector, the tariffs have to go up. And they're the lowest tariffs in the region at the moment, so there's plenty of, plenty of room for that, but we have to ensure that the social safety net for the poorest in society is there such that they're protected from those. And I think I would be right in saying that your Kumpthor gold mine was one of the important investments that EBRD made in, in Kyrgyzstan. Mm -hmm. Given this, what were the key lessons that you took away from this project and how have you moved forward after it? Okay, It's very important that we work with foreign direct investors, from large and small, in all of our countries of operations. And the significance of Sentera Kumtor for this economy is absolutely huge. It's about 17% of government revenues. So it's always going to be something that's politicized in the country. It's, being, it's size being um, uh, so significant for the budget. It's a large employer, one of the largest employers in the, in the country as well. Um, and it's faced a whole lot of challenges in, um, uh, the government's faced a lot of challenges in its relationship with Sentera Kumtor, which have been well documented and I won't, won't go into any detail. But I think what we've learned is when you have such a large investor um, and it has such a huge weight within the economy, we can use our good offices to help resolve problems between that investor and, um, and the government. 
and we've done that on a number of occasions. Um, the mine, uh, as I understand, has um, uh, eight or nine years left to run in its, in its current phase. I think uh, the relationship over the last year or so has been um, up and down, but it certainly improved on the situation that, that we were in two years ago. Um, I'll leave it there. The, the Belt and Road Initiative is becoming mm -hmm. quite prominent in this region. What are your, as an organisation, what are your views on this initiative and have you had any work with it so far? Um, we had our annual meeting in May of this year in Jordan um, and there were, uh, on the first day of our annual meeting, there were two um, sessions. Uh, one of them was on the Belt and Road Initiative and the other one was on Uzbekistan and they were both packed out for, for similar reasons. I think the, the interest of potential investors in this region now with Uzbekistan as part of it and as part of the Belt and Road Initiative is huge. So essentially we've gone from having, for us, a region of, of um, 35 million people to having a region of um, 67 million people with, uh, with um, us having operations again in Uzbekistan. And I think with the changes in the Uzbek regime, um, with the new president uh, and the reforms that have already taken place, uh, Central Asia is a much more interesting p prospect for, for foreign direct investors. That, coupled with the Belt and Road Initiative, makes it um, very attractive. If there's a lot of infrastructure funding coming from, coming from China for BRI, as there is in all of our countries of operations in, in the region, um, in road and, uh, and rail infrastructure, uh, but also in energy and in water and so on, there's a large amount of investment coming from China. Uh, and we certainly encourage that. China, um, as of uh, uh, 2017, became a shareholder of EBRD. It's a member of the EBRD. Um, uh, as an example of our commitment to BRI and in, in the region, in November, um, we'll have a, uh, a Central Asia um, investment forum in Beijing. And there we will try to attract both um, Chinese and regional investors um, into the um, uh, that are interested in, in, in investing in, in the region, as well as um, government officials from all of our countries of, of operations and government officials from China as well. We're very serious about our cooperation with BRI. And related to BRI is, of course, AIIB. Mm -hmm. In Tajikistan, there's been cooperation between your organization and AIIB. Is there anything in the pipeline for Kyrgyzstan? Well, uh, that um, investment in, in the road in, in, in uh, Tajikistan was the first AIIB um, uh, investment overall, um, not just in Central Asia, but overall. So we're, we're quite proud of that. We have other things in the pipeline um, for investment with, with AIIB, but not, nothing that I'm able to discuss at the moment. But um, we take that cooperation very, uh, very seriously, uh, and we're in regular contact with, uh, with sector teams. I think AIIB at the moment, it, as it's in its growth phase, it's building teams and so on, will probably rely on partners like us and the ADB and the World Bank to, um, to, to help them to develop their own um, investment projects. And we're, we're happy to continue that in the area of infrastructure, uh, in transport and, and particularly energy as well. And if I may ask a slightly more challenging question, some people have posed concerns over the more geopolitical elements of the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. Given your partnership with it, does that pose any concerns about your, your own direction as, a, as an organisation? Not really, no. I wouldn't, say that it, I wouldn't say that it does. We're not planning to dilute our own environmental standards. We work according to country strategies which are approved with our... Uh, in conjunction with our, with our shareholders and with our countries of operations. Um, we wouldn't push our um, uh, host governments in a direction that they wouldn't want to go in. We certainly wouldn't want to see them taking on large amounts of debt for, um, for vanity projects. So we're, we're, we're quite clear on that. So I'm not concerned that through the, the areas of, of BRI that we would want to be involved in would, would, uh, would raise those sorts of concerns. We're very sensitive to that already. And EBRD was set up after the Cold War, highlighting a, a Western-based development model. Mm -hmm. With the rise of China, it highlights an alternative model. How does the success or the ongoing success of this coexist with, with, with what you've been doing? Does that suggest any way which you may want to develop your own mandate? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. I At the end of the Cold War, I think um, the West thought it had won. 
the West thought that its model for capitalism had won. I think, however, some of our countries of operations, the model of capitalism that they adopted was a rather brutal one, um, uh, and not one that was well regulated and had in mind the protection of everybody in society and for the benefit of everybody in society. I think both we've changed and our countries of operations have changed in their realization that um, the Western Thatcherite, Reaganite model of, uh, of of capitalism. Perhaps now we've um, we've diluted that a little bit, or we've softened that a little bit. So much so that now we're less about the insistence on privatisation as we may have been in the 1990s, and we're more about commercial commercialization and um, commercial discipline uh, within state-owned enterprises and even state-owned banks as well. So we're willing to work with those sorts of entities before. And that's much, I guess, it's closer to the Chinese model. Um, it's a step closer to the Chinese model, which may help um, Chinese investors to be more comfortable with, with what we're doing, make us more comfortable with the, with the Chinese model of, of investment in this region as well. So I think we've taken steps towards each other. But it's a, it's a very good question. Um, uh, when you look at what we used to do with privatization processes in some of our, some of our countries of operations, um, our conditionality were really quite tough. Whereas nowadays we're willing to be much more soft about um, privatization. We had a meeting last week with the president of, of, of Kyrgyzstan. We talked about um, commercialization of some state-owned enterprises. 10, 12 years ago, well, maybe 15 years ago, that would definitely have been a conversation about privatization. But that's changed. Thank you. And given the increasing importance of a relationship with China, how do the Kyrgyz way of doing business differ from the Chinese way of doing business? Well, that's another good question, but I don't, I don't think I have a good answer to that. This is a very democratic society. It's a, it's a society that involves um, consensus building um, at every level of decision making, from from families and groups of friends to collectives at work and and um, and the government and parliament and, and regional governments, it can be um, can be a bit frustrating at times in order to do what you have to do to bring everybody along. But I'd rather have it this way than in in some of the um, democratically more challenging um, countries in, in this region that are both our countries of operation and, uh, and not. Um, how that fits with the Chinese way of doing business, I, I don't know that much about how Chinese companies do business, but from, from, uh, from what I understand, um, they have um, a, a clear partnership between uh, regional, municipal and, and central governments and the private sector. They seem to pull all in the same direction. Achieving that is precisely what um, business people and governments find difficult to do here. So I think that the, the, there'll be some challenges, and there are some challenges in, in doing that in, in Kyrgyzstan. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why levels of Chinese FDI here are lower than in na some neighboring countries. It could well be the reason. So a good question. And looking at perceptions and public awareness of Chinese, of the Chinese in Kyrgyzstan, mm -hmm. how do you think that's changed over the last five years, both within your community and if you're able to perhaps expand on a, a political, a more politically minded community, a, a general community, think tankers, journalists, whatever scope you're, you're willing to engage with it? Um, I think on occasions we're a little bit um, uh, thinkers about Central Asia. Um, whether they be in, in universities or in international financial institutions or in um, or in think tanks, um, tend to worry about the influence of China over this region and that um, governments might be getting too close to China. Of the finance ministers and, uh, and, and senior government officials that I know in our countries of operations in this region, they're much more sensitized to that than, than we are. They understand the name of the game. Um, all of our countries of operations in this region have had a large neighbor that they've just cleaved themselves from a generation ago. And they're not likely to hitch themselves to a new big brother anytime soon, whether that be um, China or whether it be um, other influential country, countries in the region, um, such as Turkey or 
back to Russia. I think the influence of all of those um, three powers is very uh, important in this region. But um, uh, finance ministers, prime ministers, heads of state in this region are trying to balance those interests. So I'm, I'm not concerned that, um, that the relationship with China will get too strong. I think um, uh, most of our government counterparts are very keen to have it at the appropriate level. Now, I think in Kyrgyzstan, the, the um, level of foreign direct investment from China and the level of infrastructure and lending and so on is, is lower than it is in, in other countries. And that perhaps reflects the geographical proximity of, of Kyrgyzstan to China. It's a very small country. It's a very poor country. And I think they're more likely to be cautious about new relationships, um, perhaps more than a larger, uh, more powerful country um, like Kazakhstan. And looking forward, what do you see as the key challenges for EBRD in the future? Um, I've already mentioned sovereign indebtedness and, and helping the government to cope with that. Um, I also think they face some reform challenges without which um, the huge potential of, uh, of some sectors can't be, uh, can't be harnessed. And in particular, that's in the power sector. There's a massive potential here for hydropower, and production um, and for the export of power. So there's a regional project called CASA 1000, which I'm sure you've, you've heard about, which is about building um, export infrastructure for um, Tajikistan and Kyrgyz Republic um, in order to export to the south towards Afghanistan and the Indian subcontinent. Um, if some difficult reforms can be made here, it could be a huge, it could dwarf the amount of revenues that are coming from Kumto, for example, if they could if they can um, make those difficult reforms. And they're, they're really difficult reforms. They are um, regime-challenging reforms that will have to be made um, in the next few years in order for that to happen. So that's one of the big challenges. I think support for the private sector here is good. I think access to finance for the private sector is improving. And the sort of advice that the private sector is getting from us, from uh, the International Finance Corporation and others, is really excellent. So that the opportunities for growth in an economy like this, particularly when you look at uh, the market opening up, 33 million people in Uzbekistan, and we have a huge border with Uzbekistan, particularly in the south, there's a, a, a vibrancy to that part of the, the region, but also the membership of the Eurasian Economic Union. These two things mean that Kyrgyzstan can really sell itself as a what do they call it, a, a, an export pontoon. You start here and you move into these other markets from, from here. And I think that's a, a becoming a more and more um, compelling case for the country. Here, there's probably better address uh, via the courts to resolve um, legal problems than there is in, in, in other countries in the region. Um, they do face huge problems with corruption. Um, uh, but in general, this is a very open, democratic uh, and transparent society and not just compared with its neighbors but compared with similar sized countries with similar sized GDPs I think they're doing a lot of the right things sometimes that's hard to see when you live here obviously and you get frustrated with things but I really think the direction of travel is a very good one very positive and looking at the Belt and Road Initiative what do you think are the greatest challenges to this development strategy over the next five years for the Belt and Road Initiative, the, their big challenge is to ma maintain the coherence of their program. Pretty much any country that you go to in the world nowadays claims to be part of the Belt and Road Initiative. It's becoming geographically, literally, very, very wide. And I think the, uh, the managers of that program, the people that are uh, leading that program, I think they should be careful n that it doesn't get diluted any further, because sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to understand.